Hi. Uh, right, my name's John Davis. Thank you very much for the introduction. And um, uh, I'm the co-chair and co-founder of the South Wales Cyber Security Cluster. We are a networking group, cluster of organizations that are all uh, interested and working in the area of cybersecurity. So how many people in the room here, just to start off, are familiar with cybersecurity as a concept? Can I get some hands? So, so, oh, that's brilliant. Okay, that's terrific. So have you turned up to this because you are familiar with cybersecurity? Or have you turned up because you want to find out more about cybersecurity? More? Excellent. Okay. So what we're going to do is we've got about 40 minutes, and in that 40 minutes, I'd like to give you a little bit of an overview of, of cybersecurity, what it's about, why it's suddenly become big news, uh, why it's a bit of a buzzword, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about the cluster itself and how it was formed, and then I'm going to introduce you to our panel of experts, and they blush every time I say this. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you who they are and what they do, and then they'll introduce themselves. And then we'll be delighted to take questions from you in the audience. And hopefully what we'll tell you up front will prompt some of those questions. So the first thing about cybersecurity is that, as in a lot of things in the IT world, it's a little bit of a buzzword. So when cloud arrived and the cloud became the buzzword, everybody in IT said, well, that's just a data center space. Why is that called cloud now? It was called data centers last week. What's going on? It's just a bit of a gimmick. And the same thing happened, actually, um, with things like big data. That's the next one. Everything's big data. Um, and that's a, you know, in a lot of ways, that's a buzzword. And cybersecurity, if you think about it, information security has been around for donkey's years. We've always thought about the security of our information. And there's a lovely show that goes on, a big trade show in London called InfoSec. That celebrated its 20th year this year. So it's not a new concept, is it? So why is it that it suddenly emerged and why are we now all buzzing around, around cybersecurity? So what happened in 2011? I'm just going to take you back a few years. In 2011, the government, the cabinet, all got together in their powwow room and they had an update of the national security strategy. This is a big review that says who's going to invade us, who's going to drop missiles on us, which terrorists are going to come after us, etc. And they've all got to work out how many bullets they need to buy and how many soldiers they need and how many warships they should have. For the first time in history, one of the top five items as a critical threat to the nation in that review was cybersecurity. And it was listed as cybersecurity because the whole of the country of Estonia had been shut down the year before. They shut all of the internet connection. When I say they, they think it was the Russians, but they're really not sure and they can't say. So the whole country got shut down for a week. That's a country. And everybody suddenly thought, well, what if they did that to the UK? What if they shut all of the internet pipes into the UK? What would happen to our infrastructure? What would happen to our banking? The Estonian economy is still trying to recover. There's only three banks in Estonia now because all the others went bust or did a runner. So suddenly, we've got a national security strategy that needs to take this seriously. There was born the national cybersecurity strategy, and this was run by one of the cabinet ministers, Francis Maud. He had the task of coming up with a big strategy. He came out with four strands, four key objectives. Let's learn more. Let's get more information out there and educate people. Let's be more wise about it. Let's communicate. Let's communicate with each other. Let's have businesses communicating with the police and vice versa. Well, let's get skills. We need cyber skills, loads of cyber. We need more people skilled in this. We need to get people trained up in it. We need to have more people in any other country in the world. And finally, let's do more business. Because if you've got those three things, you know, you've only got to monetize it, haven't you? It was a great talk that the previous speaker talking about how do we monetize our driveways? How do we monetize cybersecurity skills? How do we make some money as an economy out of that and become famous in the world for it? So that was what came out of the government, out of the national strategy. That spawned a whole bunch of initiatives, and you'll hear about those initiatives all over the news and all over the various organizations, universities. University of South Wales are driving about skills and education and students and bringing on degree courses. We've got the police, the national police, but also Tarian, the Southern Wales Regional Organized Crime Unit, are making big strides in trying to communicate with small businesses to say, please tell us when you're getting hit with cybersecurity attacks. We need to know how we can help you, etc. There are sharing partners partnerships for sharing that information. Training courses and skills courses are available and there's grants and funding available to businesses to enhance those cyber skills. There are schemes available to help small businesses to become more secure like the cyber essential schemes, etc, etc. So we're a bunch of guys and girls running businesses in Wales and saying we work in cybersecurity. We should form a networking group. We should all get together once a month. We should swap ideas. We should network. 
which could work out how we can support those four objectives. How can we educate people? How can we get the word out there? And that's what we did. We formed a cybersecurity cluster. It's based on the same model as a cluster that was formed very similar to it in Malvern. That was the original cluster, the Malvern Hills. A hotbed for cybersecurity. Who'd have thought? And they do water in little bottles and cybersecurity. So we modeled our cluster on exactly the same structure. There are now clusters, by the way, cybersecurity clusters popping up all over the UK. So at the moment, we're up to about 17 of them. We're welcoming the North Wales cybersecurity cluster very shortly. They're having their first meeting next month. But as a South Wales cluster, we are now up to, what have we got now, gang? 50, closing on 50 companies. We get together once a month. Um, everybody's welcome to attend. We've got full details on our website, etc. But if we are a cybersecurity cluster, we've got all of this expertise, we've got all of this knowledge, and one of the key objectives of the strategy is we've got to share that with you. So that's what we want to do today, is we're going to share that information with you. And to do that, we have with us Damon Rands from a company called Wolfbury. We have uh, Kerry Ann Jones from a company called UDL, Urquhart Dykes and Lord LLP. We have Mark Edwards from Capital Network Solutions, and we have Kelvin Jones, who's from Accelero. Now, I'd like you, each of you, please, to give us a bit of an introduction. Tell us who you are, what you do, and why I keep calling you experts in the field. So, who's going to go first, Damon? <laughs> Thank you, John. As John kindly said, my name is Damon Rands, and my company is Wolfbury. Um, my expertise lies in information assurance and pen testing. And quite simply, that is, um, we assist companies identifying critical data and the critical processes that help their fu business function. And then we add a layer of security. And as regards pen testing, that is, we attempt to compromise sites using various nefarious methods. In other words, we try hacking them. Uh, now, uh, there's a, a huge um, situation at the moment with um, businesses oops, <laughs> attempting to perform their own pen tests um, without the real relevant uh, experience. And what that involves is um, Businesses are um, attempting to use products like Nmap and Nisus, which are fantastic products, and they, uh, they do test, but they only test one single point of failure within their systems, and it's giving SMEs and businesses a, um, a false sense of security. They think just because they've tested their firewall and their router, they're fine. I'll give you a, a, a brilliant example of where we were working last week. I was working for a company. We were called in to do a pen test. And before we did anything, the first thing we'll do when we do a pen test is a harvest of their web information. So what is available on site? And quite quickly, we could see that the MD was um, a prolific social media user. It didn't take long for us to discover his wife's name, her birthday, their anniversary, the kids' names, their kids' birthdays, their pet dog, and even the registration of his car, which was on Instagram. From this, we built a password list of about three, three and a half thousand words, all combinations of all the data that we'd found, and within two and a half hours, his iPhone account had been compromised, his Twitter account had been compromised, his system account had been compromised, and his wireless for his business was compromised all because he had just given too much information on social media. We hadn't approached their while, we hadn't approached anything technical, it was purely information finding. He thought he'd been secure because he had run a, an Nmap test that showed him that his router was okay. So we urge companies to really, you know, get a proper pen test from a proper professional because there is so much more security than just checking that point where your company meets the internet. Is that? Um, my name is Kerry Ann Jones. I'm a patent attorney with UDL based uh, in Cardiff and Bristol and elsewhere in the UK. I used to be a computer scientist for more years than I'm going to tell you about before taking a career change, some sort of professional midlife crisis. Um, and became a patent attorney, and given that background, 
I specialize in protection of software and computer related technologies. So the clients that I work with are innovators in various uh, technical arenas. Uh, but it became quite apparent to me uh, over the last few years that, that cybersecurity was certainly an area of increasing innovation within South Wales because more and more clients were coming to me with um, security related technologies which needed protecting. So um, I work with uh, companies around the world um, and also in the local area here in South Wales who are into software security, um, cryptogra uh, cryptographic stuff, um, encryption, um, fintech, uh, chip and pin software, also the hardware security, so I work with companies that um, do secure tokens, etc., etc. Um, and like I said, that was a, certainly a trend in technology and in the industry that was really becoming quite apparent to me, which is um, why I ended up getting in touch with John um, and, the, and the cluster got going. Um, so the cyber security related industry is definitely alive and kicking in South Wales. Definitely. I think we've got a microphone on this side. Thanks okay. okay, thank you, Kerry Ann. Uh, thanks for the introduction as well, John. Uh, my name is uh, Mark Edwards. I'm technical director for um, Capital Network Solutions. We're uh, based just outside Cardiff, or Barry as we call it. Um, but, <laughs> but Cardiff sounds a lot better to most people. Um, everyone knows where it is. Um, I've been in the industry for over 20 years now. Um, I started off as a, uh, an IT security professional, but as John alluded to earlier on, since cyber's become sexy, I'm now a cyber security professional but it's, it's exactly the same thing. Um, like Damon, uh, we do penetration testing. I'm a qualified penetration tester in forensics. Um, but really, one of the biggest challenges we find um, in Capital Network Solutions is um, not a technical issue, actually. Um, it, the penetration testing, technical and controls are just one thing, but it's the awareness I find is the problem, the awareness and buy-in from senior management. If you don't have awareness or buy-in from senior management, then you don't have a cybersecurity policy, and that's it. I speak to a lot of companies, and uh, ask them uh, you know, what their attitude is to cybersecurity. Most of them tell us that um, security, cybersecurity isn't represented on their board and isn't even dis discussed regularly on their board. Um, they leave it to the IT department. Well, that's fine. Um, the IT department are usually very effective at developing, um, a, oh, sorry, to, uh, implementing a security policy, but they're not the people who should be developing that security policy. They quite often will not know the risks of the company. They certainly won't know the assets of the company um, or what the, the, the board actually finds um, uh, are they critical assets and also they won't have the financial authority or other authority to make any changes necessary for it. So we, we um, promote the fact that the, any successful cybersecurity policy has got to be driven at senior management level um, uh, within any company. Um, so what, what does that, that has meant for us is we become evangelists for this new um, security uh, scheme that John has mentioned, and the UK government uh, Cyber Essential Scheme. And this scheme is uh, five simple controls, it's very cost effective, developed in conjunction with um, GCHQ and leading industry members and professional bodies, and it will protect a company against up to 80% of all known threats. And so when we go and see our, uh, our clients now, um, the, the, the board tell us we don't know about cybersecurity, um, we get conflicting advice, but now we can tell them, it's not us telling you to do this, it's the UK government are telling you that if you do this, if you implement cyber essentials, your company has got a good baseline of cyber security. So at the moment, we hope and this will change the landscape of uh, cyber security throughout the UK. Yeah, uh, th thanks, Mark. I I'm Calvin Jones. I'm Managing Director of Accelerate Digital Solutions. Um, we're a software house based in Bridgend. Uh, fundamentally, our, our um, business is, is writing bespoke software products. But over the last few years, we've been putting together a, a, an application that allows us to improve the way software is developed by generating the code and removing the programmer from the loop as much as possible. Security has become a, a big issue uh, in, our, in our life cycle, our, our software development life cycle, because we, we believe that we can generate more secure systems than if we were hand coding them because of the, the, the inherent human error problems we have with, with programmers. So we're, we're, we're focusing on cybersecurity at the moment within the application to, to allow us to, to, to basically sell more secure systems to our customers, our potential customers. 
One of the areas that, uh, that I'm currently investigating is how much organizations pay to cybersecurity when they buy in systems. And it, it seems that in most cases it's a, an add-on thought. They're actually not, not including cybersecurity questions in their tenders, or if they are, they're, they're just lip service questions. They're not actually going into any, any real depth. So one of the th things that I'm trying to, to, try to understand better is how can we make sure that organizations buying software are buying the, the most secure software for the, the system that they want to implement. No, that's yeah. really good. Thanks very much, Colin. Um, so, that's why they're experts. Now then, from your perspective, so running small businesses, running organizations, wanting to know how you can be more cyber secure and get a better awareness of cyber security from people like, like the experts we have here. Step one in the process, Kerry ann information. What information have you got on your systems in your organization that if it got into the wrong hands, it would cost you either reputational loss or financial loss, or even put you out of business. So that's not all the information you've got in the business by any means. It's not going to be your internal telephone directory. Uh, you'd be surprised how much money organizations spend to protect that. But what information have you got? What are these little golden nuggets of information that are the core of your, in, your, your IP, your intellectual property? Or are your key lists of clients' details, or whether it's credit card details or bank account details? These are the pieces of information that really need protecting. So the first step is a risk assessment, and organizations like Urquhart and people like Kerry Ann will help you to understand what from within all of, the all of the information in my organization should I be protecting properly? Just focus on that. You don't need to do risk assessments of every single aspect of your business and every piece of information in your business. Just look for what's the stuff that's really, if you like, risky. The next step then in the process is to call in somebody who was very polite, I thought, Damon, when he was describing the fact that basically he's a hacker. So the bad guys are basically Damon's who don't wear white hats like the cowboys in the cowboy films, anyone in a white hat's a good guy and anyone in a black hat is a bad guy. Actually, in the IT industry, that's the phrase we use. Black hat, hatter, uh, black hat hackers, I'm not gonna get that right, and white hat hackers. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna call in a daemon who's a white hat hacker, and you're gonna say, these are my golden nuggets, this is the stuff that would really cause me problems if somebody got hold of it, you try and get hold of it. Attack me, attack my systems, penetrate the systems, and see if you can get hold of my golden nuggets. So that's the second step. And that'll be a point steady on, seriously. You can tell we're in Wales, can't you? Get hold of that, do you see what I did there? So, okay, so that's what Damon's gonna do. That is a point in time check of your security. And Damon will find those vulnerabilities. If you've got vulnerabilities in your infrastructure or in your people or in your organization, he'll find them and he'll say, these are the, these are the things you have to fix. Now, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you probably need to fix anyway, right? This is all very specific, specific information and a specific vulnerabilities. But as Mark said, there are 80% of the attacks that take place on a day-to-day -day basis can be fixed by just fixing five things in your organization if you get those right. And that's the cyber essential scheme. And uh, Mark and Kelvin are able to come into organizations and help and talk through those five things. I believe there's government funding available as well for organizations if they need to spend money to fix those problems and to fix those vulnerabilities. So there are standard vulnerabilities with the Cyber Essential Scheme uh, from the government. And then finally, we're talking about information security, but we're not necessarily talking about it on bits of paper. You know those bits of paper that go in the filing cabinet and then you lock the filing cabinet and you take the key home? The good old days? We're not talking about that. We're talking about putting that information, getting it off paper, and putting it onto systems. And that's when it becomes vulnerable, because people can access those systems with, you know, without having to have a filing cabinet key. And actually, Kelvin's right. We put it onto, when do we say, we put it onto systems, we're writing that as data into software packages. How secure are those? Every hack that can get information out of a system is a hack into the software that the system is sitting on. So this idea that what we're after doing here is saying, look, just take a look at the software because that's actually the filing cabinet itself and it might not even have any locks. It might have all the locks and the keys on the front and then you go around the back of the filing cabinet and it's empty. Then you can just get straight into the files. And that's really this notion of take a look at your software platforms and look at how we can secure those. So if we combine risk assessments with regular pen tests, 
with the five things that the government says we should do, and let's take a closer look at our software, because that's actually where the information lives, we're in pretty good shape. Just to round that off, uh, I work for an organization called Pervade Software, and we've developed a, a, a security monitoring solution that effectively does the job of five or six very specialist security monitoring pieces and rolls it all into one to make it much more affordable, much more marketable, and small businesses can now enjoy all of the monitoring capabilities that Lloyd's Bank would use and British Aerospace would use and British Telecom use, and that's what our product does. So we are, we're really, we're not in the point in time securing, we're in that through time securing because we can put a monitoring system which shines the spotlight on the vulnerabilities, on the particular golden nuggets, on the software packages that are being protected by Cyber Essentials and give you that peace of mind through a dashboard. So, so that's what we do. So that's the information we've got and that's who we are. So hopefully that's given you a flavor for why, why we think we can sit up here. I, I will say, first of all, before we get into some questions, and I've got some starter for 10 questions here that I got fed from the Twitter feed. So we'll start off with those and then I'll open it up to questions to the floor. Uh, but the first thing I've got to say is, if you've got any interest at all in learning more about any of the topics that we've either discussed already or that we're about to raise in questions, we use microphones, I think, on either side of the hall, so you can ask a question here. But also, we're all exhibiting downstairs. So the cybersecurity cluster I mentioned is now up to almost 50 businesses. Downstairs, there are 40 companies exhibiting. 11 of those companies are cybersecurity cluster members. So you'll be able to get a wide range of information from them, and we'll be downstairs in the expo after this. So are you ready for these questions? Because I've read them, and seriously, you know, what are these Twitterers thinking? But OK, here's what we've got then. So the first question is actually about information and information protecting that risk, that risk assessment piece. So Kerry ann the, the, the question is, how do we know what should or shouldn't be protected in an organization? In my, so how do I know what information should or shouldn't be protected? Have you got any advice for that? Um, well, I think the point that you were making earlier, John, was, is really valid, that the companies and organizations need to be really discerning um, when they're looking at, at protecting as to what needs to be protecting. And that comes down really to the bottom line, is what is valuable to your organization? Um, so for example, you know, spending thousands of pounds getting a firewall, as you say, to protect your phone book, um, and then walking around with valuable IP that you spend, you know, way m more money on uh, developing over a longer period of time, walking around with that on a memory stick in your pocket, um, you know, doesn't make sense. Uh, how would you feel if that IP that you have spent all those years developing flowed out the door to a competitor and then they got that competitive edge in the marketplace? Um, after you've invested the time, effort, and money. So it is about being discerning. You can't protect everything, um, or you, I guess theoretically, but not in the real world. So it is about being discerning about what is actually of value to your organization. Um, and it's not necessarily the really obvious stuff. Um, and I would also say it's about the education of everybody in your organization as well as to what is valuable and why it is valuable. Um, so, for example, teaching, let's say, admin staff why it's important to switch the machine off at the end of the day, just because they can't be bothered in the morning to press the on button and wait for it to reboot, you know, and explaining, well, perhaps you haven't had your updates overnight, you know, when you switch that machine down, perhaps now we're vulnerable. Think about what can happen. So is, there's a lot of, of education in, across the entire firm, as, as uh, Mark was saying, you know, definitely driven from the top down. Um, but getting everybody thinking about what is valuable to the company and why it's valuable and why they need to protect it um, is absolutely crucial. No, that's very good. Mark, it, 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 Kerry has just referred you back to a comment you made earlier on, which was, which was very pertinent, which is about, this is about senior management. This is about the people that own the business, that run the business. And in a lot of cases, we do find that information that goes missing, it's the person that owns and runs the business that's liable for that. So, you know, the million, the million pound fines that we hear about the big boys having to play, you know, pay for credit card losses. The Data Protection Act is coming up, and the Data Protection Act is going to take a percentage of your turnover yeah. if you lose even, you know, the slightest piece of sensitive information. So, do you think in terms of identify, answering this question 
for, um, I can't even pronounce the, the, the Twitter uh, handle, so I'm not going to try, but this, this question about how do I know what information should be protected, do you think there's a role for senior management in that, in terms of identifying that? Well, well absolutely. As I sort of uh, mentioned in my, um, my, my opening um, uh, talk on that, um, it's, it's usually left to the IT department, um, but as Karen mentioned, it, the IT department won't know what the assets are for that company. Yes, they might know your server's important, your file server's important, but they don't know which parts of that data is important, critical to the company, and which part of it is just um, yeah, just noise, really. Yeah, some people will, will save pictures on there. They'll save their personal pictures. You don't want to spend a lot of money protecting those pictures. You want to spend a lot of money protecting what is critical to you. Um, so that, that's where people like carry on are critical to um, identify what those assets are. And then people such as Damon are the ones to, uh, and myself, are the ones that, that, can, that can protect that information for you. Um, I say, talking back to the Cyber Essential Scheme, um, John mentioned that uh, it's mainly senior management, or uh, quite a large portion of um, the, uh, breaches are caused by senior management themselves and that's quite often because they demand uh, because they're important they demand having administrative accounts they demand having access at, why, I, at home I can go and install whatever application I want and I need this for my business so therefore I want to do that in work I need to be able to install applications update for applications all the time so I need administrative access well if you want administrative access the government tell you you won't get cyber essentials you're not secure the only people who should have administrator access for example would be IT um, administrators, and then they should only use it if they're actually um, using it to do admin an administrative task. The worst thing that can happen is to give it to someone who generally logs in um, as an administrative user, got control of everything, the, the controls the kingdom, so therefore if they get a, a malware, piece of malware on the machine, your company can be finished, it can do whatever it wants. That, yeah, that's a very real risk. That's a very real risk. So uh, that's a great question. Uh, the next question we had actually um, was about penetration testing um, and vulnerability scanning. Uh, and the, the question uh, was, once, a, once an organization has had a penetration test, once they've had a penetration test done, and there's a whole host of advice that says, you know, fix this bit, fix this bit, this is a vulnerability. Once they've done that, is that them done? Are they, uh, should they consider themselves to be secure at that point? And you know, that, I know there's an awful lot of companies that do that. They'll buy somebody in, they'll get their penetration test done, they'll go, great, I'll tick that box and then I'll get on with my day job. So do you think that an organization is safe once they've had a penetration test done? Well, uh, as you said on your talk earlier, it's a moment in time test, firstly. So it's only checking that moment. It can take one update from Microsoft to blow your, your, your security posture out of the water at that point. But it's also, it is a great check. I mean, and we test companies. Um, and some companies are fantastic, and they're locked down. But with my hacker hat on. White hat. White hat, yeah. Gray hat, yeah. <laughs> um, with that hat on, I, um, if they're locked down, then we'll leave them alone. And we'll basically try and go around a side entrance. And what that normally means is, their suppliers, whether it's their accountants, whether it's their IT support company, you know, we will approach from different angles to try to access them. And that's where a lot of businesses fall down, that they think they're secure, and that's fantastic, and they tell their staff what to do, but their vendors, so their suppliers, like their IT, the photocopier companies, they're really lapsed. And these are the guys who are taking your computer out of the office to repair it. When your computer's done, you let them take that away, what's happening to the data on it, same with photocopiers and you know, your phone systems. You're relying on these people, and these people have control of your infrastructure. So that's why, again, we go back to Cyber Essentials, a fantastic thing for a business to have, and then a lot of businesses are forcing it out to their supply, so their supply chain, which like I'm sure Mark will agree is a fantastic way well, to adopt uh, Cyber Essentials. So that's a very good point. Colin, I know you're also involved in Cyber Essentials. And it, uh, have you had this experience where organizations have adopted Cyber Essentials for themselves, they've put those five steps in place, and then they've pushed that out to the, to the organizations that are their suppliers and their partners? Oh, well, um, not yet is the, is the quick answer to that. But I, I think that that's definitely the way that all decisions are thinking. So they, they, they're certainly looking at how their supply chain uh, is their risk or part of their risk. So I think, I think certainly it's a, it's a goal for us to try and talk to some of the larger companies to see whether we can get their supply chain more secure by implementing the sub-essentials. Yeah. Well, that, that, I mean, that's a great answer, not yet. So let me throw that open to the group. 
we've just introduced a concept here that says it's all very well for you to be secure, but guess what? You've got people sending you emails who are your suppliers. You've got your partners, people that are external to your organization who actually get information or access to your information systems. And, and actually, truth be known, there's probably one of the, the biggest hacks of the last couple of years that, that made the news was a, an organization called Target. I don't know if any of you heard about that hack. It was millions and millions of details, credit card details and personal details. It's a very high profile one, along with the one with Sony. Everybody's aware of the Sony hack, where Sony Corporation got hacked. Uh, the Target hack was actually an email sent to, the, to somebody in the business from their CRM system company, supposedly. So it was a spoofed email saying, oh, your CRM system needs a quick update. Sorry, it's a patch. There's something wrong with it. Click here you know, and download this patch, and it'll fix your CRM system problem. Don't worry, governor. It'll be all right. And somebody just clicked the button. Immediately, there's some malware. A whole, a whole load of records got stolen. Millions and millions of pounds lost, etc. So it's a very real threat. Hands in the air, just a quick show of hands in the air. If you've thought about cybersecurity for your businesses, have you also thought about how cybersecurity then extends outside your businesses and into your suppliers and your partners and even your customers? Yeah. You see, that's only two or three. That, that is exactly what we're seeing, Calvin. That was the answer that you just gave, was not yet. And I would urge organizations not, them, not, not just to look at their own you know, cyber essentials and cybersecurity, but when you're selecting a supplier, you can now say to the supplier, okay, well, I'll work with you, if you've got cyber essential certification, if you can show me that you've done what's needed on this government scheme, then I'll work with you. And that's what we're starting to see now. Governmental and certainly some education contracts and tenders have that as a stipulation. And there's absolutely no reason why organizations can't do that themselves and say, well, we're not going to deal with you unless you've got these essential things covered. So I think that's a terrific answer. Thanks very much for that. So um, I've, I've got a couple more here, but before I kind of throw into them, is there any, are there any questions from the audience? Because this is about you, really, not the tweeters. Any, anybody, anybody in the audience got a question? We've got a hand raised there. Can we get a microphone over there? Is this going to be a really hard question? Because if it is, I'll give it to one of them. <laughs> is it? OK. Um, hi. Uh, I'd like to ask the question as to whether companies should really take a better look at what data they decide to store and choose to not store unnecessary information. There's an awful lot of data that goes, uh, is a target of the criminal, uh, purely and simply because a company thinks they ought to store personal information in, in, in more in-depth way or credit card details and so forth uh, that really are perhaps totally unnecessary for, for their purposes. That, that, that's a great question. Kelvin, could, do, you want to, do you want to pick that up? Yeah, um, that's one of the areas where we're working in quite, uh, quite a lot at the moment, where we're analysing a problem with our customer, and part of that analysis exercise is to understand why they want to store the data. I think that we want to include security questions about the data and how they want it stored and why they want to store it as part of the systems analysis exercise. So we have to make sure that we include security as a, as a first-class question when we're building systems from scratch and new systems. Well, no, that's very good. I think as, a, as an extension of the question as well, it's about the, there's the first question is, do I need to be storing that information at all? And the next thing is, do I really need to be storing information across multiple platforms? So if I've got to look at my software and I've got to determine whether I've got safe software, then it would be better actually if I can secure one lockdown area of my business, make that super secure and make sure that all the information is within that very super secure area instead of having to secure everything. So organizations do tend to try and secure everything to the outer fence of the house, including the garden shed. And they spend a lot of money on kind of locks for the garden shed door. And when they open the shed, there's nothing in there. There's, you know, there's, there's nothing worth taking. So rather than focusing the money on the back door of the house, they're pushing their boundaries out and spending money that is wasted. And I think, you know, if you're Lloyds Bank, feel, you know, feel free. You know, nobody minds British aerospace wasting money on cybersecurity, but actually small businesses, they really can't can't do it. So it's, it's a, that's a good question. Thank you. And John, if I can uh, interrupt yeah, there for a sure. moment. Um, with, the, with the new proposed changes to the Data Protection Act, that focuses a lot on what data you can store and for how long you should store it. So the change is just proposed at the moment, but it's likely they're going to be ratified this year and then implemented uh, within two years' time. But that has very strict controls of what data you're allowed to store and how long you can store it for, which I think is a positive change. And, and, the implications for when, and and also, it's going to have quite an impact on the implications of what happens if you are uh, not careful with that data and who is responsible. So, for example, if you go and leave your laptop um, on, on a train, 
um, that will have to be reported. Um, so it's going to be fairly onerous. That's my understanding is, is if this comes in. Absolutely. It's really going to have quite an impact on the, the liability, the legal liabilities on companies for um, control of data. Uh, it's really going to bring this to the forefront of... Yeah, and if, and if, if you, uh, if, uh, further on from that, Carrie-Anne, is, is, uh, you're right. Um, you have to at the moment it says you have to report any uh, information security breach. If you don't, you're in violation of the Data Protection Act and the fines for that are up to 2 million euros or I think it is 2% uh, of your global turnover. Yeah, it, it's so for a large company, it's a significant amount of money. So you, and you have to report any breach, not just a significant breach. Yeah, so that anybody who's storing... Um, potentially sensitive data, which is basically any organization, um, you need to be aware of that legislation that's coming in because it is going to impact you and the implications can be quite severe. Actually, I think it, it, it's really handy, actually, that it is coming in. I know, I know nobody likes legislation and nobody likes regulation, but actually having Absolutely. something that says, I'm not sure what information I should be protecting, but here's a policy that tells me exactly what I should be protecting and for how long is a great starting point, isn't it? That's, that's great. Are there any other questions from the audience? We've got time to go. Oh, right, we've got, we've got, can we get a microphone over somewhere? You've got it over in this corner. Um, slightly, um, uh, do you see the Internet of Things as a, um, as a threat or, or an opportunity for organizations? Slightly loaded question, really. Is it a loaded question? It is a bit. The Internet of Things. That's a great question. Yeah. Okay, so uh, is the Internet... Is everybody familiar with the concept of the Internet of Things, first of all? Is everybody, everybody nodding at me about what the Internet of Things is all about? Yep, cool. Okay. So, Damon, do you want to take that? Well, it's a risk for organizations. It's an opportunity for cyber companies. <laughs> um, it really is. I, I don't know whether you saw recently the, the, the problem with the Samsung televisions, the voice control televisions, that all of us and everybody discovered, they re constantly record what everybody is saying. You just imagine how many boardrooms in London with their swanky voice control televisions panicked in the morning when they discovered everything was being streamed off to Korea for analysis. Just absolutely brilliant. So the Internet of Things is amazing. And we also, at InfoSec last week, we were talking homes getting hacked through intelligent kettles which is just an absolutely fantastic thing because all these devices are plugged into the networks. They are, I mean, there is no antivirus at the moment for a fridge. You don't plug your fridge through the firewall. It's a real open stream into your network. And it's like photocopiers. I always go on about photocopiers because they are such a vulnerability on systems. Um, yeah, Internet of Things is a real threat for businesses and it's something everybody's going to get their heads around, exactly like BYOD as well. So. Yeah. yeah, we're finding this in the, uh, obviously we're a monitoring organization, a monitoring business. So how do you go about, you know, we can monitor people's IT infrastructure because it's all in one place and there's all wires attached to it. It's a bit of a piece of cake. But when you've got the Internet of Things at play, you've now got devices that are going to be carried around by individuals in their phones and on their wristwatches and everywhere else. And if we think about that as a bit of a monitoring nightmare, how do we go about, uh, about protecting those? And there's really two sides to the, to the question, I think. The first side of the question is, how do we protect the Internet of Things because it's my thing, and if somebody hacks it, they get information about me, and I'm the person that's, uh, that's being threatened because you're attacking my thing, whether it's my fridge or whether it's my BMW car or whether it's my iWatch. So that's the first aspect, is can you protect me better and my thing? But actually, there's a whole other side to the Internet of Things as well, which says I can hack into, the, into people's things, and then I can use those things to go on and attack other infrastructures. So denial of service attacks tend to be formed by individuals who will attack uh, a website or a front end or an application, and they'll attack that application from a computer, and then they'll, they'll hit it and hit it and hit it and hit it and try to, try to protect, you know, other people can't access it because they're busy trying to. Well, imagine if I can actually hack into 5,000 fridges and get all of those fridges to hit, you know, the Royal Bank of Scotland's main servers. You know, suddenly I'm now using the Internet of Things as my botnets. I'm using them as my army, my tools, my, my tools of the devil. <laughs> is your Samsung iPhones. And if we think that's, you know, that's not right. There was a survey done, Stanford University. They basically produced, these are students, by the way, it says a lot. They're, 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 the way they come at these problems is just incredible. The students have got such a creativity and such a flair, and none of the uh, none of the boundaries of what's proper and what should you do on an IT system. They just they just come out with all sorts of ideas. So a team of students in Stanford University created an iPhone app. It was an Android app, actually, not an iPhone app. They, they created an, an Android app, and it was a flashlight 
So you know your phone's got the little flashlight thing on it. And they said, this is a flashlight. It's 10 times brighter than any other flashlight. And it's a much better flashlight in the world. And if you want it, here it is. It's on the marketplace, and it's a download. Uh, and the moment you downloaded it, obviously, it downloads a whole bunch of other stuff with it, including a root kit onto your Android phone, and they could do whatever they wanted with it. And all they actually made it do was, was phone home and tell them that you'd done it. So and, and the, what it was also asking was, just, just as an exercise, because they did that first, and they got you know, 10,000 people downloaded this thing. And then they said, well, actually, what we're going to do is we're going to make it even more obvious now and see if people really are that, that thick. And they said, you have to press a button to say, enable geolocation services. Have you seen these on your phone? You know, you get an application that says, do you want to enable geolocation? Okay, why do you need geolocation services for an iPhone flashlight? You know, for a, an Android phone flashlight. But they, they said that. And then they said, oh, yeah, you also have to press a button to enable your microphone. You don't need your microphone for a, for a flashlight either. This is so obvious. This is so painfully obvious that this is, that this is a spoof. 5,000 people downloaded it, and 50% of them said yes to both the geolocation and the flashlight. That's 2,500 people had enabled a rootkit on their Androids, which could now be the phone's home, gives the details back to these students, and they've now got 2,500 machines that they can use. Just to put that into context, 50 machines can bring down any website on the planet. Two and a half thousand machines could probably bring down eBay. And this is a bunch of students in Stanford knocking this out on an, on an Android. So the Internet of Things has got, I think, two aspects to it. It's got that personal protection aspect, and then the how do we protect ourselves from those things on the Internet that actually could be turned into weapons. So that, that's a terrific question. We're, we're out of time, unfortunately. I've just been waved at furiously. So thank you very much for the reminder. Uh, just, just, to, just to round off, I'd like to thank uh, Damon, pen testing, uh, Kerry Ann on information risk assessment and intellectual property, uh, Mark on cyber essentials and uh, senior management level protection, and Kelvin on uh, software and securing software. We're just five representatives of the cluster. As I say, there are 50 businesses in the cluster. Consider us, please, as a single point of contact if you've got any issues, any questions, any queries, or any business needs that revolve around cybersecurity. Because if you contact us as a cluster, we will have more than one company within our group who can help you, uh, and we'd like to treat you know we'd like you to think of us as trusted advisors. So we have a website. The details you can get downstairs. The big roll-up banner, and as I say, there's 11 of us exhibiting. So uh, thank you very much, panel, and thank you very much for your questions and for your time. <laughs>